Hey besties, I enjoy all things history, mystery, conspiracy, and paranormal. I love to do deep dives on topics that I often stumble upon surely by chance. And I love telling stories. So welcome to Sit and Spin. Today, I'm going to be spinning up this roving that I dyed. This is a BFL. I used my teal and salmon to dye this and it came out quite pretty. It is still a bit damp but it's going to spin fine. So I'll spin this while we talk about the Mandela effect. Whew, I got fluffies on my nose. As you can tell I have been working on this and I think I've hurt my brain. I may have sprained something. So now I'm going to do the same to you. If I have to endure this, so do you. <laughs> so let's spin a yarn. By now we've all likely heard of the Mandela effect, but let's look at what it actually is. So the Mandela effect is people collectively misremembering an image or an event or a pop culture thing like a book or a movie or a television show. Holly Schiff, a licensed clinical psychologist in Greenwich, Connecticut, explains, quote, it occurs when many different people incorrectly remember the same thing. So essentially a collective false memory. From a neuroscience perspective, when you recall memories versus remembering them perfectly, they become influenced to the extent that they can eventually become incorrect. Memory is not infallible and can be unreliable at times." End quote. So let's look at some of these collective false memories. The one that irks so many people is the Berenstain Bears, spelled S-T-E-I-N. Or is it Berenstain? S-T-A-I-N bears. It's stain, although that hurts my brain. That's so not how I remember them. So yes, I suffer from the Mandela effect. Picture Mickey Mouse in the old black and white steamboat wheelie cartoon. Is he wearing suspenders? If you said yes, you're wrong. What about Mr. Monopoly? Monocle, no monocle? That's right, he does not wear one. Again, I remember a monocle. What about Fruit of the Loom? It does not have a cornucopia. Curious George never had a tail. So these are all low stakes. They're not going to make the world explode. But they do hurt the head when your memories don't align with the facts because this makes you doubt what you think you know, and it can lead to being more open to stranger explanations. That, you know, maybe the timeline changed, or maybe the powers that be are lying to us for some reason, or maybe we shifted realities, or maybe we all just live in a simulation and these anomalies are just programming glitches. <laughs> You can drive yourself mad just by agonizing over whether Mickey Mouse had suspenders. Let's look at this in detail and see if we can make some sense of it all. Back to the beginning. Let's start with the person who gave this phenomenon its name. Nelson Mandela. For those too young to remember, first of all, study your history. Second of all, let me give you a brief synopsis synopsis, words are hard, synopsis of who he was and why he was so important. Mandela was born and raised in South Africa, the name of an actual country in Africa, not a general area. At the time, South Africa was ruled by apartheid, a system of racial segregation that favored whites because white people kind of suck. 
Mandela's entire life history is long and complicated, but you can get a good summary on his Wikipedia page. Go have a read of that. For our purposes, know that he became involved in opposing the white min minority rulers, and this led to acts of violence and sabotage, because when you're a rep repressed people, you'll do whatever you can to throw that off. So, he was captured and sentenced to life in prison in 1962, and he stayed there for 27 years. He suffered many health problems over the years, but was eventually released and exonerated in 1990. From there, he helped negotiate the end of apartheid, and he rose to become the president of South Africa. He was a complicated man, and the politics are even more complicated. But as a symbol of a cause, his importance can't be denied. So, how did he become the name of this phenomenon? Well, a large portion of the world believes that he died in prison in the 80s. I'm one of them. I believed for the longest time that he was dead. Right up until I heard he was elected president, actually. And I was like, wait, what? As I was still young at the time, I kind of, you know, just shrugged it off, shoddy memory. And I didn't realize that so many other people thought the same thing. This was the early days of the internet, so you couldn't just, you know, jump into a discussion group and find out the truth or hash it out or say, hey, I thought he was dead and have dozens of other people go, me too. In fact... I thought nothing of it until I started hearing about the Mandela effect. And even then, I just shrugged it off as making a mountain out of a molehill. We have crappy memories as a species. It's not a surprise. I didn't realize that the Mandela effect is just a small piece of a huge and scary puzzle. One that makes me worry for everyone. So... Come with me on my journey into being way <laughs> creeped out. So who dubbed this the Mandela Effect? That would be paranormal researcher Fiona Brew. Her welcome page at FionaBroom.com, so F-I-O-N-A-B-R-O-O-M-E.com, reads, quote, I find haunted places and investigate paranormal phenomena. I'm also the person who, back in 2009, launched the Mandela Effect topic online. I never expected it to become so popular or so misunderstood. I mean, <laughs> wow. In general, I'm always skeptical until I run out of reasonable science-based explanations for whatever we witness. Then yes, I am a believer. But I'll still keep looking for more normal answers, end quote. So Fiona, Fiona, I just gave her a new name. So Fiona is an author, researcher, location scout, historian, and media consultant. She's a busy woman. She's the founder of hollowhill.com, H-O-L-L-O-W-H-I-L-L.com, one of the original ghost-related websites and has written more than a thousand ghost-related articles for magazines and websites. So she's considered an expert in her field. Initially, Fiona had a website for the Mandela Effect where people discussed the various effects they found and theorized and how and why these came to be. So as I looked around her current site, I found a blog post titled, quote, Why I So Rarely Talk About the Mandela Effect. End quote. I was curious as to why the person who started the whole phenomenon wouldn't want to continue to discuss it, so I had to read. So there wasn't much in the blog post, but when I scrolled to the comments section, I began to understand. This was posted by a user named Paul Robles on March 14th, 2024 at 8.39 p.m. So very, very recently. And he had this to say, quote, 
I've done extensive research on this topic, which led me here. It's interesting that Fiona doesn't own up to the fact that she just remembered wrong or took a science fiction book too seriously, which made people confused. I don't know how it caused this much mass confusion, but in my most humble opinion, Fiona just rode this ridiculous wave that's spitting out of control to this day, and she just enjoys it. Why don't you just tell the truth and stop with the weird alternative universe simulation theory BS? End quote. So here we have a big case of angry man syndrome. And this is why I worry about being on the internet. I would have flipped out and told the guy off. Fiona, she's way more mature than me. Here's her response, which I think gives her perspective on the entire phenomenon quite clearly. She says, quote, Paul, clearly you have missed the point of the original Mandela Effect website. I understand it's been offline for years. As I've said in my book, I started that website to find out how many other people mistakenly thought Nelson Mandela had died in prison and how slash why we'd been confused. I still don't have an answer to that. To date, no explanation fits what I recall, but I'm still searching. Over time, and as more people join the conversation, the number of misremembered topics grew. We tried to find some commonalities or patterns, but never reached a confident conclusion. There was no one-size-fits-all answer. Not for the more bizarre ones, anyway. What followed from there were fun, speculative conversations. We didn't take the topic that seriously. It was mostly flippant, geeky, whimsy, with a few what-the-heck additions, and lots of delightful sci-fi and quantum references. I'm sorry, you can't appreciate the threads that follow on the actual Mandela Effect site, and continue to this day, at least in conversations that I participate in. Some are speculative, others are banter, and a few are serious. If you can't discern the differences, it's best that you halt your extensive research because it's clearly confused and upset you. I don't like some ways this topic has spun, but the toothpaste won't go back into the tube. I mourn the loss of the fun, whimsical conversations and quirky connections we made from 2009 to 2011 or so. But that was over 10 years ago and we can't freeze time not yet anyway, or keep viral topics in a corral. Once they're in the wild, well, that's it. They go wild, LOL. If you're going to hold me personally responsible for how social media and trolls have evolved and devolved the Mandela Effect topic, well, I'm not sure I can put a label on the various ways it's been spun. I'd have to be superhuman even to monitor all of them, much less much less put the brakes on the crazier, in the not-so-hilarious way, versions of the topic. I've been a fan of quantum studies since I first stumbled onto Matt Planck's theories related to en energy quanta, and growing up in the halls of MIT, related topics have steadily fascinated me. Do quantum studies actually explain some of the Mandela effect? I haven't a clue. Though I'm the first to admit that we're still knee-deep at speculation rather than solid proof in our related discussions, well, if you can't hear the fun in it, acknowledging that text rarely conveys voice as well as it might, please find other, more interesting topics for your extensive research. Personally, I wince at the various related conspiracy theories. Also, I utterly hate that people are using the Mandela Effect to lead gullible people to question their very own real memories. That's destabilizing, and it's not okay. Nobody, even me, yes I'm joking, can control, censor every Mandela Effect conversation. If I could use one word for how I feel about the weird way some folks twist it, 
and how very seriously they take what had been the flippant speculation, it would be exasperation. However, there were still some fun and amusing conversations, and I'll admit that, yes, I enjoy these. This isn't one of them, and I hope that clears up obvious confusions for you and others. I get really, really tired of explaining this. End quote. Obviously, in the early days, Fiona enjoyed the discussions and theorizing, but in the way of the internet, people began to take it too seriously. And I feel for her as she's being held responsible for all of it. So what are the, some of the concerning theories surrounding the Mandela effect? Let's get into it. That was really evil. <laughs> Though the original video has since been removed, TikTok user at Dim Lifting theorized that Fruit of the Loom did originally have the cornucopia in their lo logo. But in 1973, the company was responsible for one of the largest chemical poisonings in the Western world. And Dim Lifting theorized that a corporate rebrand brand was responsible for the cornucopia disappearing. Okay, sure. But that hardly seems the way to go. A whole new name would make more sense, but you do you boo. There have been people showing the logo on vintage shirts with the cornucopia, but that's not really reliable evidence. And if you've been playing a drinking game where you do a shot every time I say cornucopia, you must be proper smashed by now. <laughs> so again, this seems pretty low stakes. I mean, who cares if there was or wasn't a cornucopia, right? It's not really a huge deal. Just say that that's what it was. You know, it was a rebrand. No big deal. But one of the hosts of the Mind's Eye podcast on TikTok thinks this is just part of a bigger conspiracy. They believe manipulating people into questioning memories from their childhood is just the first step. Because after they convince them of that, what else can we be collectively brainwashed into believing? It's a chilling thought, but I don't think that the powers that be can run a scam that long. Not and keep it together. I just can't see it working. But this led me down the rabbit hole to the most chilling theory that literally creeped me out. This one says that the CERN Large Hadron Collider has caused endless parallel realities and that these false memories are echoes of the past that once existed. Okay, 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 okay. I hear you. You're telling me put on my tinfoil hat, I've gone too far down the rabbit hole, and that I'm lost in the rabbit warren. But stick with me. You'll see why it creeps me out. I promise. I'll bring this all together. First, let's talk about the LHC. I'm not calling it the lar Large Hadron Collider every time, and you can see why I can barely say it once. So forget that. It's the LHC. Now make that your drinking game word every time I say LHC. Drink. You'll be right smashed by the time we're done. So straight from home.cern, which is the CERN homepage, the LHC is described as, quote, the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator. It first started up on the 10th of September 2008 and remains the latest addition to CERN's Accelerator Complex. The LHC consists of a 27-kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures to boost the energy of the particles along the way. End quote. So exactly why do we want to accelerate particles? Don't they move fast enough on their own? Well, we want to speed them up and collide them. Hence the collider name. <laughs> but wait, isn't that a really bad idea? I mean, it sounds like one to me, but who can figure scientists? 
Stanford University says the goal is to answer questions such as what is all matter made of and what creates the interactions of matter at the most fundamental lo level. Let me interpret that for you because we can and we want to see what happens. This makes me think of Dr. Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park, brilliantly played by the endlessly sexy Jeff Goldblum. Quote, yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. End quote. I've always loved that. So, could these collisions be responsible for actually changing our timeline? Of course, if they are, it's something that would be very hard to prove as we won't have any evidence that anything has changed. So, let's look and see if we can see any correlation between collision and new Mandela effects. While the LHC first went operational in September 2008, initial testing was delayed until November 2009 due to damage from a magnet quench incident. Fancy terms. It's just a way of saying a connection failed and it released the helium that's used for cooling the magnets into the tunnel where it wasn't supposed to be. But at least the entire complex didn't blow up, right? This meant their first successful run was from 2010 to 2013. Collisions that happened in this run led to the following discoveries. The first creation of a quark gluon plasma. The first observations of the very rare decay of the BS meson into two muons. I have no idea, but apparently it was pretty exciting. And of course, they found the long sought Higgs boson or God particle. We're in this rabbit warren and I could go down the tunnel that leads to the quark gluon plasma, which sounds uber cool. Or I could try and figure out the rare decay but then they mentioned the God particle, and I immediately rushed down that tunnel screaming, show me! Space.com provided an explanation I could understand without a physics degree, so let's see how they explain it. Quote, the Higgs boson is a fundamental force-carrying particle of the Higgs field which is responsible for granting other particles their mass. This field was first proposed in the mid 60s by Peter Higgs, for whom the particle is named, and his colleagues. The LHC confirmed the existence of the Higgs field and the mechanism that gives rise to mass and thus completed the standard model of particle physics, the best description we have of the subatomic sub world. End quote. So their science for dummies is pretty good, but the grammar, <laughs> let me edit it for you as far as my understanding goes. So Higgs proposed a field that gives other particles their mass, but couldn't prove it. In order to do so, they had to use a boson, which is a force carrier particle that only exists when particles interact with each other. For example, when two particles rub up against each other lovingly, they exchange a photon. The force carrying particle of electromagnetic fields, the boson. Hold on, we're almost through the hard stuff. Quantum field theory describes the microscopic world and they prefer to think of the boson as a wave in a field as opposed to a photon. Okay, semantics, but all right. So in that model, a photon is a particle and the wave that rises from an excited electromagnetic field is the Higgs field. The two give birth to the Higgs boson particle or something like that. 
But if you understand quantum physics or physics in general, maybe you can explain it better. But why did they call this the God particle? <laughs> I freaking love this story. This is the stuff that you don't hear every day. Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Lenderman dubbed the Higgs boson particle that, quote, goddamn particle, end quote, in frustration because the at the time theoretical particle was so hard to try and confirm. But when Lenderman wrote a book on the Higgs boson in the 1990s, publishers changed the title from the goddamn particle to the god particle which as far as I'm concerned was really, really stupid and changed the entire feeling of the title. Anyways, my brain is now ready to explode. Implode? Whatever. No more science. Give me conspiracy. Conspiracy I can understand. So I went down that rabbit-worn tunnel on my way to try and determine when the LHC was running and if there were correlations between it running and the new Mandela effects being reported. They did their first runs in 2008, but didn't have their first actual collision until 2010. The OG phenomenon was reported in 2008, all about Nelson Mandela. It was after that, that more and more discrepancies were reported. LHC planned to shut down in 2012 for upgrades and improvements, but once they had found that goddamn particle, they decided to extend their run to 2013. The long shutdown lasted from 2013 to 2015 when the LHC was restarted, and it ran from 2015 to 2018. Then came long shutdown number two that ran from 2018 to 2022. The next operational run began on April 22nd, 2022, and is expected to continue until 2026. So right now, as I'm spinning, the LHC is running. Have things changed? Would we know if they did? <sighs> okay. This is where I started to freak out. When I heard that the LHC was causing Mandela effects, it tickled my imagination. I mean, why wouldn't it? It's, it's a crazy theory. When I heard that they'd fired up the LHC again in April 2022, I gave it a couple of months and then went looking to see if there was any new Mandela effects. I near had a heart attack when I found one. Seriously. Scared the snot out of me. Have you heard about King Tut? The boy king whose tomb was discovered intact in the Egyptian desert? Do you remember his incredible golden mask that toured world museums? It was one of the most flamboyant artifacts discovered. And I don't know about the rest of you, but it sparked the imagination of this girl when she was young. I dream of being in on the discovery of an ancient tomb filled with magical artifacts. I poured over magazines at my high school library because we didn't have the internet. And I'd stare in amazement at the glossy pictures of everything recovered from King Tut's tomb. But that mask, you remember it. That shiny gold with the blue enamel stripes around the face. The snake centered on the forehead. The vulture head beside it. Wait, what? Vulture head? Yeah, that's right. Let's see which memory you have. Is this what you remember? Because I sure as hell don't. There was no vulture head. Look at the statue of Amenhotep. That's the kind of headdress I remember. Not this. What is that deformed monstrosity? All right, I'm being a bit overly dramatic, but this really seriously does unsettle me. 
I really feel like I've never seen that mask before. That's not my King Tut, despite all other aspects being exactly the same. I'm starting to understand the feeling of being freaked out by Mandela effects, but why is it so disturbing to us? Let's get into the psychology of this phenomenon. And of course, when you're talking psychology, the best place to start is the Psychology Today website. They posted an article by Michael Varnum, PhD, titled, quote, The Psychology Behind the Mandela Effect, end quote, on February 28th, 2024. So this is recent, and it seems like a reliable source. What did PhD Varnum have to say? They start with a description of the phenomenon and give a few examples. Now, let's get to the good parts. Quote, to some, these discrepancies between our memories and reality are evidence of parallel universes, shifting timelines, or glitches in the matrix. And indeed, these effects are disconcerting to many of us. But their explanation likely lies not in reality having changed in some spooky way, but rather in some of the fundamental properties of how the memory works, end quote. I love how they qualify it with likely. That's not really reassuring and it smacks of covering your ass in case it turns out that shifting realities are actually true. He concluded with, quote, our memory for small details tends not to be great and it gets worse as time goes by. We rely on schemas to organize our experiences and understanding of the world and often use familiarity to indicate accuracy. We also can conflate pieces of knowledge and different experiences, creating plausible yet inaccurate collages." End quote. So he believes Mandela effects are shoddy memory and conflation not conflagration, which I enjoy. <laughs> Burn it all! Of course, I kid. I kid. We're not burning it all. But conflation is the act of combining two or more separate things into one whole, especially pieces of texts or ideas. Okay, interesting. Popular Mechanics posted an article by Daisy Hernandez titled, quote, the science behind the reality bending Mandela effect, end quote, on December 30th of 2021. Now, I love this article. Daisy is a fantastic writer and she talks to a lot of professionals and they lay it out in a way that's easy to understand. I'm going to link the article in the description box and I highly recommend you read it. It will make the psychology aspect of it, very easy to understand. I'm going to talk about some of it though. Just if you want the entire big picture, go read that article. It's fantastic. So Daisy says, quote, memories are unreliable for many reasons, but a contributing factor might be the complex arrangement of memory storage in our brains. We don't have central memory storage units, end quote. So basically, there's this complicated highway in our head that leads to memories. And those memories are, quote, psychological combinations of visual perceptions, auditory perceptions, and emotional responses, end quote. We also have a need to fill our memory gaps with educated guesses. This is known as confabulation. No, confabulation. There we go. Big words. We do this because as humans, we don't like the unknown. The unknown causes uncertainty and confusion, which is contrary to survival, which of course we're all wired for. I'm starting to think we can't trust anything we remember, which is truly terrifying. But wait, there's more. Quote, 
if new information contradicts something we already believe, we might twist that new information to make it fit the pattern we're familiar with seeing, end quote. And our belief in the information we're receiving can be influenced by the source. Quote, when someone we trust, a family member, politician, or social media influencer spreads misinformation, it can lead to another kind of pseudo memory. False not because our memories are inaccurate, but rather because the base information was never true. End quote. <sighs> so where does this leave us? I have to say I'm even more uncertain about what the Mandela effect actually means. Is it a conspiracy? Is it nothing more than a quirk of humanity and memory? Or is there something larger going on? For me, I'm side eye in the CERN accelerator. I don't trust that thing. So now that you have a headache along with me, and possibly a bit of a complex, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, guys. I hope you enjoyed a good yarn, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!